I remember sitting in a kind of the bar that, that we'd frequent as students and just being like, wow, this is this is kind of wild. This yeah. is actually, you know, and um, then we would see that the song was being shazammed on like places, you know, I wouldn't have dreamt of, of, of it being heard. I was like an indie, like I was unknown in Ireland yeah. entirely. I mean, like I had no, I had never played that song on a stage at that point. It was Amazing. like, you know, straight out at the gate. Welcome into the show, the amazing Andrew Hosier Byrne. How are you, hey, my friend? I'm good. Thank you very much for having me. Thanks for coming in. What's the weirdest pronunciation of your name you've ever heard? Ooh, I mean, I've heard a lot. One guy called me uh, Declan Stevenson once. Um, no, <laughs> Is that I, the wrong podcast? Yeah, that? That's the wrong. <laughs> no, you get, I got a lot of, um, you know, you get a lot of Hosiers, you get a lot of Hosiers, you know. You go to France, it is originally a French name, so in, over there, you just, it's Hosier. So, you, you know, that's the French pronunciation. Um, that's, that's the French. And then it was yeah. Anglican I somewhere. But yeah. What about the, you know, you hear all these names on TikTok, Baghdadi, Forest God. Where do those come from? I Some of them kind of relate back to Irish literature, right? Um, I don't know. There's a kind of, there's a certain type of, yeah, the, I have a lot of fans who kind of just associate me with them. Um, you know, I, I I think as I disappear a lot, I don't keep too much of a of a of a social media presence all that much. So when I'm away between album cycles, they kind of they fill that negative space with with stuff. Stuff. Yeah. yeah. There's probably no paparazzi in Ireland, right? When you're there, it's really you being alone by the seashore and Yeah, I don't think there really is much of it, you know. There really isn't. Yeah. I heard this great story about the pandemic and how you spent your time. You were taking care of bees, you were swimming, mm. you were living your best life. And yeah. it, it's you know, it's got to be very, very quiet living over there, I assume. I enjoy it. I really do. Yeah. And especially in the pandemic, I mean, I was I was given a chance to spend more time there than I had in a long time. So just to kind of plug back into that local community a bit more and just do do my thing was nice. Well, we're going to get into the new record, which was made during the pandemic. It's de definitely not a pandemic record. Let's mm -hmm. uh, make that clear for sure. But your history, how you grew up. Tell, talk to me about life growing up in Ireland, what it was like and your mom and dad and kind of music all around you at that point, what it was like for you. Yeah. Um, I think when I was a kid, when I was a, still a child, we kind of moved further out into the countryside. Um, I know music was always kind of, you don't really realize it as a kid, but music was always part of it. My dad had been a gigging drummer, had like a, was like a gigging musician uh, before he sort of went a bit more nine to five after he had a, a a bunch of kids, you know, um, kind of a blues musician, right? Yeah, but he was he was particularly with rhythm and blues, blues music, and kind of like rock and roll. So, um, at the time, sixties and seventies, it would have been a huge. There was a, a huge kind of interest in blues. Obviously, like in the UK and in Ireland, you know, guitarists like Rory Gallagher, he kind of represents that generation's um, sort of studying and and uh, recreating of, of a lot of the sort of blues blues music of of, of here in America. But um, so yeah, so he was he was there was blues music always playing in the house, soul music and rock music always playing in the house, you know. And uh, he was a huge David Bowie fan, also he's a huge kind of uh, Peter Gabriel fan. So it was always it was always an eclectic mix. And then we moved out to the countryside, and so yeah, it kind of narrows the influences of apart from what music was kind of being played in the house, and and so I had this. I guess that that's something I sort of channeled later on. Is, is like, you know, I, I lived a bit more in 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 the out in the outdoor spaces, mm. and um, enjoyed that. But it was, yeah, it was quiet. It was quiet. You know, it was it was. Um, I don't know how to describe it. I, as a teenager, I, I I was always able to sing as a kid. You know, I always had a voice. I didn't like singing as a kid. I was going to say a bit reluctantly, right? You almost didn't want to sing early on. No, I felt. I was always the kid who could could sing a little bit. So you're you're being pressured into singing at church services. You're being pressured into singing at school events by the teacher or whatever. And it just feels weird. You know, here's words, here's a song you've no relationship with, and then you're kind of put in front of a into a crowd of of strangers, and then it just gawk at you while you while you sing a song. It never felt good. Um, but then as it, you know, as I grew older, I, I gained an interest in music, and I started singing singing songs that I actually enjoyed and cared about and found my own voice in that started teaching myself how to play guitar and slowly but surely teaching myself how to write music I guess and, and gained a new sort of personal relationship with it that was really significant I guess at the time and, and, and who were some of the artists you were listening to early on I know Tom Waits was a big influence on you but Tom Waits, yeah Tom Waits was a big one um 
when I was maybe 15 or 16, I guess, I joined like myself and my brother was was uh, playing drums at the time. And we joined a bunch of musicians who were kind of from the local area who also had an interest in, in primarily soul music, jazz music. And at 15 or so, I joined a, a group of musicians. They needed a vocalist. So these bunch of 18 year olds who were just about to go into college. And so that was fun. I was a vocalist for this kind of covers band. We just used to cover soul music. So I discovered new stuff through them, like Captain Beefheart and um, and uh, probably a little bit more of Tom Waits through them and and, and jazz music through, through some of those players. And so, yeah, I was really interested in like voices in particular, I guess, hearing Otis Redding for the first time, or Aretha Franklin, there's certain blues voices and blues players, and John Lee Hooker, I was fixated on for a while. Um, guys like Skip James, obviously Robert Johnson. And the first, I'd kind of learned how to play a few chords on guitar, but then getting to know one of the guitar players in this band, he showed me how to tune a guitar to an open chord. He gave me my first slide. And then I, 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 I kind of came back to playing guitar as a teenage, as a 15 year old, um, trying to learn like Robert Johnson songs and stuff like that. So it was, I <laughs> By the way, a hard artist to learn at 15, right? Such an incredible guitar player. Yeah, it was nuts. Yeah, yeah. it is nuts. But you kind of start slow and you just, <laughs> you're, trying to, you're just trying to figure out the, the fifth and seventh fret and then the, and then the 12th fret and you're finding little, little runs here and there. Do you um, remember your first performance that you did? Um, with that band, we it was like, we used to show up to these kind of like DIY shows, like these like DIY skater goth goth and, and emo kind of kids who were like from the area with some, you know, we'd show up to there and we, we wanted to like, we'd show up in, in suits that we'd get, we'd get from, you know, like thrift stores or Salvation Army type stores. And we'd try to look, sort of look the part. And um, so those are the kind of first shows, these school halls where kids would just come in and, and set up amplifiers and, and um, do these kind of grungy, sort of like, yeah, rocker, rocker gigs and, and goth kind of gigs. Um, I think were, ACDC was one of the first songs you played, right? ACDC, yeah. that is actually probably true. Yeah. I think ACDC was like a school, school uh, concert of some kind. I was maybe whatever, 14, 13, 14. And, um, but I did play an ACDC song with a bunch <laughs> of kids in my class. Yeah. yeah. Was there a scene locally growing up? Was it just pubs and high schools and things like that? Or was there actually a scene in Ireland when you were growing up? Um, I think as I was growing up, there would have been in Dublin on with, you know, out of my access, sort of out of reach to me, you would have had a singer songwriter scene, the likes of um, um, Damien Rice, etc. cetera, sure. you know, um, um, Declan O'Rourke, all of these fantastic singer songwriters were probably finding their way and in, in that sort of Whelan's Dublin scene, um, uh, you know, Glenn Hansard, the lead singer at The Frames. Um, so they, that that would have been taking shape, and that would have been in the space Lisa Hannigan, etc. While I was while I was maybe fifteen, sixteen, but when I was a kid, twelve, thirteen, um, it was very local kind of kids just doing that DIY like grunge. backyard grunge gig yeah. type thing. And so we were always these kind of odd kids showing up in these ill-fitting suits, and then just with a brass section of three three kids. Amazing. And, and I I enjoyed it because I was fifteen and I was hanging out with eighteen year olds, so I was like had my first beer with them and stuff like that, whatever age I was. And, and it was good fun. So that, that, that was formative in a way, you know, that was, that was, I got to hear a lot of new music. I got to sing in front of crowds as a kid and, and make sense of that. And, and, um, yeah, and, 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 and deep in my relationship with music my, myself and, and, um, and I was kind of writing at the time, you, when you're teaching yourself how to play an instrument, you maybe learn how to play a song, you gain access to new chords. Yeah. And then eventually those find their way into a song that you're kind of writing. And yeah, so it was, it was, but it was, it was still countryside. It was like, you take a, you know, you wait an hour for a bus, you know, and <laughs> you, know. you end up dropping out of college. Right. And did you tell your parents, you know, this is it, this is what I want to do with my life. Music seems to be calling me. Were yeah. they encouraging you or were they saying to you, you know what? At least finish college, Andrew, because you, you, you got to get through this. Yeah, I think I think there was some reluctance on their part to be to be fully like thumbs up on that. To be fair, that makes sense, right? Makes you're, absolute you're in, sense. Right? Yeah. Um, th I I had some demos, and I remember at the time I was kind of like I was in, used to just throw loads of demos at my 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 manager Car Caroline Danny. Um, I was always throwing de demos at, and, and I remember I. Some demos got into a record label in Ireland. One of the reasons that encouraged me out of at dropping out 
I was given some studio time. They were like, let's put you in studio. Let's see what happens, you know. Um, but that studio schedule aligned with, or sorry, I should say, inter, you know, interfered with or, or overlapped with my Christmas exams for a, a year in college. <laughs> and I asked if I could defer those exam times. They were like, no, you can't do that. I asked if I could go off the book for a year and see what happens. And if they'd keep my place, they said, no, you can't do that. So I said, fine, you know, I'll just, I'll, I'll, I'll do this. I'll take, I'll burn my boats and keep moving forward. What was your major? Um, what was my major? Oh, it was just music. Yeah, oh, okay. it was music so you were theory. studying music. I yeah. was studying, yeah. studying music, yeah. It's such a great story because you end up recording Take Me to Church. You can't even find a bass player. Because nobody was around, I yeah. guess. You were calling up friends to perform. Yeah. And it was like nobody was available. Yeah. Imagine now the, the ones that you called that weren't available at the time. They yeah. must be like, I wish I was around on that day when I got that call, right? Yeah. It's so it is kind of funny. And it's something that I think, yeah, I, I laugh about still with <laughs> Alex is that um, I, Alex Ryan is my bass, current bass player. And he was in college at the time. He 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 stuck it out, you know. And uh, God bless him. He's such a such a wonderful mind for for harmony, and theory. Um, and yeah, that morning I was like calling him because I, I, getting to the studio with Rob Kerwin was like I had a few days' notice or a week's notice or something like that. It was quite short, and I wasn't sure what exactly the plan was going to be. Just went in with the demos, but I ended up playing piano on on church, and I ended up and and the other songs on like Angel of Small Deaths, which is a, a, one of the first songs we recorded, I think I ended up playing bass on it. Because I, I, your college friends are, you know, it's college. People right. are falling, people are asleep till noon. They're exactly. asleep till 1 p.m. Or 4 p.m. Or 4 p.m. <laughs> you know, it's, <laughs> they're in college. So I remember calling my buddies and I couldn't get anybody in to do the session. So I just played, ended up playing a lot more on, the, on those first few songs than, than I would have normally. But. And literally like your second TV appearance was Letterman. I mean, who would have thought, right? You start recording this record. At that point, how did you work up to your deal with Ruby Works? Um, they, they gave us, uh, we had been working on some stuff. They gave us just good rain. You know, they, they, they just trusted the demos and something shifted for me in those demos. I just started writing music that felt right to me. I, mm. I, 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 I sort of cut myself loose from the expectations of, okay, well, what do I think people want to hear? You know? And I was just like, this is what sounds good to me right now. This is what feels good to me right now. And I had this four songs and I, I think it was, I think it was Take Me to Church. I think it was a song called Angel of Small Death, like real people do. And I think Cherry Wine was the first EP. And I just I just had produced those demos as best I could and put all the vocal harmonies down and put all the, the feeling and the atmosphere down um, with whatever rudimentary knowledge I have of like working with a DAW, you know. And um, uh, they just put me with Rob Kirwan, wonderful producer from Ireland. And uh, he just he just took the best out of it. And we we deepened it and, and expanded the sound a little bit. And um, Ruby Works were just, they were, they just liked where it was, they just gave me enough, they just gave me the space I needed and gave me the the, the support I needed at that time to, to see, sort of see that sound through. And it, that sound ended up becoming that first album. And things just, things have really went, accelerated incredibly fast. We released that song and the video was directed by a, a group of, of, um, cinematographers from Ca County Cork, from Cork City, Brendan uh, Canty. It, it, a group called Feel Good Lost was his creative company. I think he's, he's still making films. And um, on a super small shoestring budget, this this group of comedians that he knew called the Derry Nain Robot Club, they played all of the main roles in that, in that Take Me to Church video. And it just it came together in this way and it, it captured a lot of hearts and minds. The video, um, the video was, was back when Reddit was like a, Reddit was like, you know, really was a, thing, yeah. was a real, real Because actually Reddit helped the song really blow up at that point. In that first day, yeah. yeah. In that first few days, it was like, I remember, I remember sitting in a kind of the bar that, that we'd frequent as students and just being like, wow, this is, this is kind of wild. This yeah. is actually, you know, and um, then we would see that the song was being shazammed on like places you know, I wouldn't have dreamt of, of, of it being heard. I was like an indie, like I was unknown in Ireland yeah. entirely. I mean, like I had no, I had never played that song on a stage at that point. It was Amazing. like, you know, straight out, out the gate. And then it, soon after it was being shazammed on like Alabama mountain radio <laughs> and stuff like that. It was like, or, you know, or it was being played on, like we were seeing it pop up on radio stations here in the States. And so yeah, things accelerated very fast. When you write a song like that, Andrew, which becomes like this global hit, I think it's at like 2 billion streams at this point, mm. you have a sentiment, it's gonna do well, but did you, did you have any idea that that song would become what it became today? I, I, I don't think so, I don't think so. I remember writing that song coming to its 
coming to the end of writing it and feeling proud of it, being excited for the song. But it's that sort of way that you kind of feel like you're excited for it. You're kind of a, you're watching something being made and you're watching something come come to itself and come to fruition. And, and uh, there's that weird feeling. You're like a parent kind of like just being proud of a kid nearly. Yeah, because when, they're all your children. They're anyway. all your children <laughs> yeah. in a way. Yeah, you know, every yeah. song you write. Yeah. Um, I was proud of it. I thought that it, I hoped that it would resonate with people, but I thought it would be a very, very small audience, that it might be appreciated by an Irish audience. Um, like at the, at the time I was hoping, you know, if I could, if I could sell out very, very small shows, if I, I didn't even have bands together. So I didn't have aspirations at that moment to be like, okay, well, I'll, I'll be, I'll tour this or I'll promote this, etc. It was just, I was completely unknown. Um, so yeah, I thought it might be appreciated. I was proud of it. I thought other people might see where the song was coming from and it might be appreciated by a, a very, very small group of people. But um, not not to the extent that it's that it it became, you know. And now years later, you have this incredible team around you. But initially, if the music just moved you, was that all that you were looking for? I just think, didn't inspire you. Personally? I think so. I yeah. think so. And I think the simpler I keep it, the better. Mm. The, the 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 more I free myself from expectations of what something must achieve with regards numbers or what something must, what the outcome must be. I think that that's um that sets up a lot of pitfalls and it kind of robs you of of enjoying the moment a little bit. I think if, if the song, I, the simplest sort of cleanest approach of just does this resonate, does it feel worthwhile, does it feel beautiful, if we can use that word and um, allow ourselves to use that word, then that's 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 that has to suffice, you know. But it is beautiful. Your new record is a journey. It's an epic journey. It's romantic. There's rock songs on there. There's romantic. It's just incredible. So we'll get into that in a moment. Hey, guys. Today's episode of the show is brought to you by the all-new DLZ Creator by Mackie. The DLZ Creator is an adaptive digital mixer designed for podcasting and streaming, and it's what I'm using right now to make this very own podcast. What makes it so special DLZ's mix agent technology takes all the hard parts out of making your podcasts. It's amazing. It's easy to use. You have three selectable user modes from easy to enhanced to professional. DLZ allows creators to any experiences to make content of their own terms. With features like setup assistant, audio mix, Mackie has taken 30 years of audio legacy and packed all their expertise into a podcasting mixer that is not only top of the line, but incredibly easy to use. You can find out more about DLZ Creator at Mackie.com. Check it out. The amazing DLZ Creator. Did you feel some kind of pressure after the success of the first record? I mean, you must have, because you, you kind of came out of nowhere, right? The song was on Bandcamp, and that's kind of how people also, besides Reddit, that's how people kind of came to know it early on, right? Yeah, I, I don't think I felt pressure um, to, to, I didn't feel, I mean, that song charted, you know, church, church, it was a big radio song and it charted. I don't think I felt pressure to repeat that, that success with regards its its chart success or its radio success. If I felt any pressure, I felt maybe pressure that the that whatever music I make is, I don't know for lack of a better word, is like useful mm. or helpful. And that was that that was that was challenging, I think. And uh and it was it was an interesting time, 2016. It was like it's it's funny. We keep saying, "Oh yeah, it felt like the world changed," or the pandemic felt like the world changed. But 2016 was an interesting time. It was like you know socially, you know there was there was there was great change, and then similar as there was in 2020, you know there was, mm. there was all great contextual changes. But um, yeah. So I, but I didn't feel a kind of I tried to free myself from the idea that okay, you know that I had never began with the approach that okay, I want to make music that is. That that charts. I want to make music that resonates with people, and people feel as honest, and that resonates with me. But there's so many things about whether it whether a hit, whether something is a hit or not a hit, that that is sometimes out of your out of your control. And, and um, to me, it's more important that it feels authentic and it feels honest and it feels uh, it feels real and worthwhile and and hopefully beautiful than whether it's a 
whether it's a charting hit. You yeah, know. they always say, though, you have your whole life to write your first record and you have like six months or a year to write your second mm, record. So yeah. what was that like for you? I mean, like I said, you did Letterman. That was your second TV appearance ever, mm, mm. right? Or your second appearance, I think, your second live performance. Yeah. I mean, that, that has to be crazy coming from small town in Ireland and all of a sudden you're on Letterman yeah. and you're looking around and the song's starting to blow up. I mean, it had to happen so quickly for you. Most bands are slugging it out for years. They might get a deal, they may not. Yeah. It happened relatively quickly for you. It did, it did. And there was definitely a challenge in that of like catching up, you know, of um, kind of catching up with myself, you know. Mm. And, you know, the, the musicians that I had around me to take with me were like, they were college friends, you know. So we were all amateurs, you know, all of us were total, like, you know, in, in, a, in, a, in an actual sense, in a, in a, in a you know, by, by, by definition, um, up until the point where we were, okay, now you're, now you, here you go. So I think, I, I think that it was the second time when I was performing in front of a camera lens. It was one beautiful uh, TV event in Ireland called Other Voices. It's like a festival that takes place in the west of Ireland. Gorgeous, um, gorgeous town called Dingle. Gorgeous kind of television music event and, and music festival. And then the second time, it was David Letterman, yeah. And it was like <laughs> when you get that call and your label says you, you know, you're going to be on Letterman. Are yeah. you just like this is? There's no way this is happening to me this quickly. Um, I think it's more. I don't even know. I can't remember what was probably going through my head. You're you're just in you're like you're just in get through it mode. You're yeah. just in like you're just white knuckling, you know. And um, it was intense, you know. That that day of promo, I think we did. I don't know how many, you know, we did, we did like three, we did three performances of Taking to Church that day before, <laughs> before, before Letterman. And I think that we do Letterman and then come to the Bowery Ballroom. So yeah, we did. Yeah. So, so like my voice at that point was shot. I'm kind of like, <laughs> like, I'm totally, I just haven't got my sea legs at this point, yeah. you know, and I think we'd done a bunch of, we did BH1, we did a, bounced around New York and, and Times Square, did a bunch of performances of, of Take Me to Church. Then we did David Letterman this, yeah, I was completely ungrounded and completely without my sea legs and wasn't terribly happy with that performance. And so it was a bit crestfallen after that, knowing that that would be my last opportunity. I think David yeah. Letterman announced his, 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 his upcoming retirement and um, to play the Letterman show. You must have been nervous. Uh, I was so fucking nervous. Yeah. yeah. There's no way you're going to Can be. I curse on this? Yeah, yeah I was, curse all you want. Absolutely was <laughs> nervous. Um, and then, um, yeah, and then... And then yeah, we did Barry Ballroom. But I have to say that there, that was that was the first time playing a show so far from home. And this is another reason I love New York so much is that was the first time I I stood on stage in front of a crowd of people that were not my home crowd, and I felt like I could do this for a living. And I I was lift I was kind of lifted out of that out of that feeling of 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 dread and and disappointment with with myself and in, in the performance of of the Letterman performance I wasn't happy with, but um. And just, just felt like, oh wow, there's there's ears here that want to hear this music, and there's people are here for it, you know. And yeah. that was really encouraging. Because the record went on to do incredibly well. I think actually it was like number one in Ireland, right? It was number one in Ireland, two hundred, finished second on the Billboard two hundreds. Let's talk about some other milestones here. Definitely, I think the Grammys for you, Annie Lennox, and. 2015 it's got to be a highlight for you right it was a good feeling yeah it was um it's such a it was to you know honored to be nominated that year and to be among those performers and also to be paired with annie lennox who's somebody who i've always had such such respect for the woman is an incredible artist in the truest sense and, and an icon in the truest sense and but also Getting to getting to know her a little bit over those days, she was incredibly kind, incredibly supportive, and offered me a lot of um, a lot of yeah, a lot of warmth and support in in what was like yeah, this kind of tumultuous time for myself, you know. But um, were you you rhythmic fan growing up? I was, uh, yeah. you know, I was familiar with their work, and then as you, you get older and you kind of you you deepen your appreciation for music that yeah. that was released before you were before you were around, before you had ears to listen to it. But yeah, for sure, you know, um, and also, I mean, she's she's she was she was really uh, bending notions of gender as well too, in a way that that Definitely. was like you know in her work. And, she was ahead of her time. She yeah. really was. Yeah. yeah, I think so. Then I guess 2015. Let's talk about VH1 Artist of the Year. We can't not talk about the Kennedy Center Honor. So talk to me about a couple of those things that are definitely milestones in your life, mm. and then we'll get into the new record, which is amazing, as I mentioned. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we recently did the um, Kennedy Honors. That was a the two. To perform, kind of, um, 
you know, in celebrating you too and their their uh, their Kennedy Award, that was really special. And I was I was glad, so glad I got to do it with them, with Brandy Carlisle, who's a a good friend, incredible artist, and and somebody, you know, I've I've huge admiration for, I've huge fondness for. She's um, she's on the new record. She's on the new record. Yeah, yeah, yeah she's we'll on Time to Get Some. Yeah. yeah, she's she's amazing. And um, now, had you met you two before? Did you know them? I assume it's all this like click in Ireland where you guys are all friends, maybe. Not right me so, but yeah, well, is it like that or is it not like that? It's like, well, I think myself, like I'm, it's very rare myself and you two kind of cross, like it's like we miss each other by a day yeah. or, but, um, but my first time, my first time meeting, meeting The Edge and meeting Bono was, um, The Edge is amazing by the way. He's such what, a what, what wonderful a nice man. Yeah, yeah, it really is such a wonderful, great. wonderful man. And, and, um, yeah, it was before we, they they did a, an event that was um, a kind of an anniversary event for Red and One and um, these two organizations that, that Bono works very, very closely with and, and to sort of mark their achievements in, in the last few few years. And, and that took place at, in Carnegie Hall here. And I met I met Bono on the edge for the first time. I just watched their show in Dublin and and then I kind of did a did a quick get out before the last song and waited in the car for the guys to to kind of come directly off stage and then into the car where we could begin talking about okay so what are we doing for for Carnegie Hall the guys are coming in you know still breathless still you know uh like pouring sweat from this incredible performance and um and then it's like hey nice to meet you okay so what are we doing for <laughs> Carnegie Hall um and they are... I is there a camaraderie there with a band like that? Obviously, again, you all grew up in the same community there, but there has to be, right? I think for all Irish artists, there is this... We're such a small island, you yeah. know, with a population that is less than that of New York, you know? What is the population of New York, you know? God, I don't want to say 8 million, but I'm probably eight, way off. 8 I million. Don't know. So we're just over half I made that, that. up, but it, it sounds good, so. Yeah, yeah so we're <laughs> like, Ireland is a smaller population, maybe the population of Manhattan, you yeah. know? Um, so to see, to see other Irish artists um, find audiences outside of Ireland, there's a great, there's a great sense of, of support and, and, and pride in that. And I think, um, you know, we we like rooting for each other, and definitely I've felt that from you too. They've, they've. I think the first time I did a sold out show in in the tr in L. A. You know, this lovely box had arrived, this beautiful bottle of uh, whiskey or something, with this this handwritten note from from Bono with the Amazing. little piece of he he's he's quite an artist. He'll yeah. do his little drawings, you know. Um, as so an incredibly thoughtful, um, incredibly thoughtful man, um, and also they live the they live. I mean, these are guys who live. The lives of two or three men. It's like Definitely. it's incredible how yeah. much their what their energy output is. How much they they take life fully by by both hands. And I, yeah, it's like you know, like I don't know. It's like they live two lives, three lives. It's incredible. Um, how much work they do, how much a a activism they do, etc. So, yeah, but that was. I mean that that was wonderful. So so to get to as you said Kennedy honors to 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 sing sort of celebrating them that was that was a special that was special for sure. Yeah, many years ago I had dinner with Jimmy Iovine and he said I'm going to bring a couple friends to dinner. I said okay great. You know he shows up with Bono and the Edge to yeah, dinner. I'm like yeah. I, you didn't even tell me they were coming, but the Edge was amazing. I had this incredible conversation with him. I think at the time his daughter was working for Apple, so I was like mm -hmm. prodding him for information. What's coming out next? You know when right. back when we had the iPod and everything was like a real huge announcement with Steve Jobs, but yeah. he's like, I can't tell you. She doesn't even tell me about what's coming out next. I'm like, yeah. please. Yeah. But um, yeah, so talk to me about obviously the VH1 Artist of the Year, because that's an incredible achievement too, oh, 2015. Yeah. We kind of skipped over that, but I wanted to go back to that for one second yeah. too. Yeah, that was, that was cool. I think what felt good about that, I think that's a voted award, was it? Was that a voted award? Which felt really good. You know, I think um, when something is, is people just are throwing their, throwing their two cents in and, and to get that yeah, and again to get that as a as a as a foreign artist, as so somebody coming in from Ireland and and you know in that first year, kind of playing in America and releasing music here in the states, and and yeah, that was that was a, that was a special that was a special moment, I think. Yeah. What were those early tours like for you? You know, it's so it's like looking back. It's some of it was white knuckling. Some of it is you know you're experiencing things for the first time, and you're you're mystified by. Um, by some parts of it, you're kind of, there's this, there's this wonderful, rom nearly romantic sense of, of, of being between, between worlds. You're not quite, you know, you're, you're, you're there for a moment and you're gone. And I think you, I, I don't know how to describe it. I think 
um, there's definitely, I will say there's, there's, there's moments that you feel like um, you just, you're overcome with, you're overcome with it's sort of a, there is the gratefulness and there's the enjoyment of it, but you're also overcome with the, the minor crisis of, well, this really has to go well. Yeah. You know, I really, really, I really want to show up for this as best I can and, and, and make sure I, I, I can execute this as best I possibly can, given what I have and given whatever little experience that I have. So you're constantly just showing up to new experiences every single time on the fly, very much seat of, seat of your pants kind of thing, you know, but... Um, so did you ever feel like you should have struggled more? Like a lot of artists early on, we were touching base on that, but they struggled a lot early on in their careers. Did you ever feel like this happened too quickly, too soon for me? I mean, obviously very grateful, which is amazing, but did you ever feel like there was part of you that should have struggled more or it should have happened like the way it happened? Yeah, I don't want to... There's part of me that... And not not quite not quite. There's part of me that doesn't want to romanticize suffering for its own sake. I feel like I I sat with my with my work for many many years in kind of in in quiet, you know, um, in in you know it. Take me to church was by no means the first song I wrote, but it was the first song I released. Um, and I will say, and this is you know we we worked. I think we worked extra, extra hard to sort of catch up with ourselves. Something I was proud of in 2015, there's this, somebody does an aggregate, does a whole, like, counts how many miles a touring group has has traveled, how many times around the world it's gone, and how many shows in a year it's done. And we were, based on that, uh, we were the hardest working touring group of 2000. Uh, 15. Amazing. Um, which was really, which was cool. So pound for pound, show yeah. for show, mile for mile, uh, we worked harder than anyone else who was, I think Blue Man Group was like also in there and something. <laughs> right. It was like, they you don't know, really count. They're not, <laughs> they're not making original music. But, um, <laughs> but we were, you know, so, you know, it, there's also, it, it, it's not like there is this kind of thing where yeah, lightning struck in some ways with a song and the, with a song and a video in the early moments. But every, Everything else of bringing the, the songs to people. I think we would do three three radio stations a week, six a.m. seven a.m. starts. We would do, um, you know, sometimes two radio stations a day before before doing a, a show that night. Like it was inch by inch, mile by mile, tooth and claw type thing. You know, um, so so I think we there was looking back at the time. I didn't think I didn't think I was working that hard. I thought everybody did it, did it that way. And then looking back, I'm like, oh my God, I could, if I did that now, I would die, you know? Um, so looking back now, I can see, I can, I get a better sense of how hard, how hard I worked, how hard we worked at that time. Um, Is it important for you to reset and be home and just take some time to yourself? Because you do take some time between albums, right? This new record, actually, the record comes out tomorrow. So congratulations. Yeah, <laughs> While we sit here today, you. the video came out, I think, today, right? Yeah. And uh, so there's an amazing, you know, there's an energy going on here. That everything's happening this week for you. But is it important for you to reset and take some time in between albums for yourself? I think it is. I, I think it is. I think um, I have a great... I'm very grateful for the home that I have and the home that I've chosen in. I mean, I travel so much, bounce around the world. I have a great community in LA of creatives and, and friends who I've known for years who and I feel, I feel very, I can get great work done there, but there is a wonderful grounding that I get back home. Um, there's this, there is a great reset that I get back home. I jump in the, in the, I spend a lot of time in the sea there when I can and there's something there's something about that. There's something about a there's a there's a restart, there's a refresh. Um it's also incredibly peaceful. I can kind of, you know, there's something that happens when you're on tour. There's something that happens when you release music. You're constantly seeing representations of yourself in interviews, in media, in photographs, in tweets, in TikToks, and whatever. Forest that, daddy, all kinds yeah, of TikTok exactly, stuff. Going exactly. On, right? And it's great. Yeah. It's wonderful. Um, but you're constantly seeing these kind of reflections of yourself that aren't you know, that here, uh, this is me, right. you know, here I am. And, and do you relate more to Andrew or Hozier? I mean, what, what relates, I mean, who are you really? Honestly, I think, I feel like <clears throat> Hozier is, is your pseudonym, but ultimately I think Andrew is just, you like to be referred to as Andrew. Yeah. Right? That's really more you. I would introduce myself as Andrew, yeah. I think. But, but what's funny about that is that 
I, there was two Andrews in my class. There's a wonderful friend of mine, Andrew. I don't know if I should, should give him names. I don't want people searching, searching my buddies, but it's like, so one of my best <laughs> friends is, is another Andrew. And so his nickname was his second name and my, my nickname was my second name. So I was always Hosier in high school. Uh, so Hosier was my nickname since I was maybe 12. So um, what's funny is I have this very small group of friends from back home who they're, they're Andrew like they're, they're the person to them is, is hosier, yeah. not the artist. If really? that makes sense. Yeah. And so it's, it's funny. It's like. Your so, high school friends still call you Andrew. I'm sure. Right. No, they all call me hosier. Oh, they do. Because okay. my, my high school nickname ah, was okay, hosier. Okay. okay. So they're used to calling you that. They're it's, used to call me yeah. hosier. So it's, 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 it's a funny mix of things, but I, I think it just seems a little bit silly referring to myself. You know what I mean? It's like, <laughs> it's it's like, like a third person. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, talk to me. There's been a four year break between this latest record that comes out tomorrow. Mm -hmm. I think by the time you listen to this, the record will be out for about a week or so. But talk to me, was it important for you to take that long in between records just to reset like we spoke about? Yeah, some of it is, you know what, some of it is, uh, I'd actually started with a few songs on the, on the road that I thought would be the beginnings of the next record, of this third record. Some of, some, some of it is that it's difficult to write on the road. It's difficult, difficult to get the headspace to, to forge, to kind of forge the, the, the idea to, to cultivate the space in which the intention and the motive and the whatever, the, the, the feeling of, of what you want to capture in the next, in the next body of work um, is while you're touring. And I think we toured the last, like we toured the first one for two, just over two years, toured the last, the second album for two years. Um, so it's kind of gaining that space again to go, okay, what do I actually, where am I now? Like, who am I now? And where am I now? And, um, and then in 2020, I think I'd started with some songs, um, at, you know, that I did record at the end of the last tour. And in 2020, it just felt like the world kind of changed and context changed. And those songs no longer resonated with you when the pandemic started to begin because you thought they're not relevant to what's going on in my life at this point, right? A little bit, yeah, yeah. a little bit. It felt like there was this great sea change, which, yeah. Um, yeah, which I felt carried along with, you know. And um, so I kind of started with a lot of new music in 2020. And, you know, there was a very quiet time. I got a lot of ideas down. I started a lot of ideas, but couldn't really travel anywhere to work with. There was a few producers I wanted to work with it was quite diff challenging to work with them. So it wasn't until really the beginning of 2022, um, 20, end of 21, beginning of 22, that let's say the borders in, in, in the States kind of opened up again. You could, could reapply for your visa and then kind of come in legitimately and, and work in a, in a studio setting. Um, so yeah, so, so the ideas were there. There was kind of stew that was cooking. And then 22, I kind of came in and hit the ground running. And it was an intensely creative time. And then started jamming when I was like, started working on new music at the same time. Ended up writing and recording all together enough, enough material for two albums. Um, and so that was a challenge also was, okay, what, you know, what, which, where do we pair this back and where do we decide what is worth going on this album and what do we share if we share later on? Yeah, I never thought I'd be so grateful just to be in a room with people and just create music exactly. or whatever it may be. And at that point, we were literally thinking we touch a tree, we could die. We have to wipe <laughs> down our cereal boxes and apples, right? right? And to think about it then, we were really all going through it. So obviously the music took on a new meaning for you. But at this point, so you go to LA, you start to record vocals. I think you mm -hmm. rent an Airbnb, right? And yeah, I was in and out of Airbnb, Airbnbs. I was kind of some Something I enjoyed about that was like I could do a month in one part of the town, part of town, month in another part of town, you know. And um, where'd that, you go? You were like in Silver Lake and Venice and all over yeah, LA, right? Yeah, totally. Yeah, yeah Abikini and, and um, Silver Lake, Echo Park, um, sometime in Studio City, sometime in West Hollywood, you know. Um, Nobody really works in LA, do they? I mean, they work in, in the music business, but mm -hmm. aside from that, and obviously the film business, a lot of people don't work in LA. Is it? It's a strange culture out there, right? I, 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 yeah, I mean, it's took, it's, it took me a long time. And part of it, it, until I had a community there, friends that I was like able to make, see maybe once a week or something like that. It's like, I, it took me a while to, to make sense of the flow of life and the pace of life in LA for sure. Cause I was traveling there seven years, eight years yeah. promoting music. I'd be in for a few days or maybe a week and then I'd be gone again. But yeah. it's funny when you come to New York, you don't, there's no one here that doesn't work. If you go to LA and you ask your friends, what are you doing today? Nothing much. Cause no one's really busy. It's yeah. like, it's again, if you're in the music industry or the film industry, yeah, but 
for some reason, there's a lot of people with a lot of leisure time in L.A. In New York, yeah. everyone's on the hustle. That's interesting. So I, I'm sure you had a lot of friends in L.A., right? You probably have a great community there that you've built this record around. Yeah, it's, it's some friends who I went to college with who kind of came, who were then working in, in L.A. at the time. And they were working. But um, <laughs> but you're, there's it, a handful of people working there, there is, for sure. But it's funny. It's like but definitely in New York, any of my Irish buddies that come over, there'd be like two or three jobs. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and it's this is. Yeah, you have to hustle to be here. You hustle. Yeah, yeah. You really earn your earn your keep to be in New York. Yeah, Definitely. for sure. Well, let's talk about the incredible new record, Unreal on Earth, just coming out tomorrow as we sit here today. There's some great music on this. You put out an EP not long ago, so a bunch of the songs that are on the new record have previously come out. Some of my favorite songs, obviously, I want to kind of break it down a little bit. So, the Selby, the video came out, actually, I think it came out today, right? Or yesterday? Um, Part yeah, two? yeah, video with um, incredible Irish actor Donald Gleeson. So, Donald is... Um, yeah, he's just. I've known I've known him a, f- a couple of years. I, I got to know him. I think through through my manager and through some some actor friends. And and um, I he, mentioned to you is on my favorite episode of Black Mirror. Yes, is, yeah. People it's a, don't know that. But it's it, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's this. It's excellent. And if you haven't watched Black Mirror, I mean, yeah, Black Mirror is it's fantastic. Because um, in Ireland, he's like a god. I mean, everybody knows him there. He's everybody knows yeah. Donald. Gleeson. He's so. He also when I was. A, I, I got to share this with him when I was a, like when I was kind of a, like in my late teens. He had done a run of of comedy like a comedy sketch show back in Ireland, and some of it he would do like for, for charity also. I think there was like this charity comedy sketch thing that he did. I think it was called Your Bad Self, and he is so he's so naturally he has such a natural humor. He's a very natural warmth and and, and kindness to him. But um, he's incredibly funny, and incredibly like he's scalpel sharp, like he's so so quick and so funny. Um, and we, I wasn't there at the shoot for this video, but we spoke myself and then, and then um, Wolf James uh, is the, the director, um, uh, Debbie. We just got we got on a, a few phone calls and talked about it, talked about the treatment, shared ideas, shared images. And, and by the way, if you watch it, it's about him digging his own grave. Ultimately. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no spoilers. But it, yeah, he's kind of, <laughs> so, you know, um, we're trying to, get, you know, get this kind of loop, this sort of, uh, this kind of loop thing going, this kind of cyclical thing. It kind of nods to elements of, of Third Policeman, and um, which DeSalby is a character in. But um, yeah, so so, but he, the performance is, is just stunning. Like he 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 is. And every time I see him, he there's another color, there's another note to his to his kind of arsenal that he's that he sort of unleashes. But in this in this, I was just astounded by how much ground he covers in in, in that character in that video. But he gave it everything, and it, the ca- concept also was kind of started with Donal. Um, in the early conversations of that video, he was like, "Okay, so here's here's what I'm seeing," and it was, "What about?" What about this dude with a shovel? And we'll kind of we kind of just we kind of rolled from there. And, and Are you like that's kind of morbid, or this is brilliant. I love it. <laughs> yeah, I was like, I was like, yeah, no, that's right up my street. So we, so, so he was, yeah. Um, I'm really proud of that video. I think he, they, I mean, he's he's a remarkable actor, and uh, I was really proud to work with him. I'm a fan of Donald Gleeson as well. Yeah. Too. Like, I'm, I've been a fan for a long time. So, um, there's that part of me that kind of dorks out about it. You yeah. Know, so. Well, the whole record kind of references Dante's Inferno, right? It's set. It's like nine different. You know, if you if you go back to that poem from years ago, talking about Dante's Inferno, and, and it's not an exact. Ref- well, it's a, it's a reference, but ultimately mm-hmm. you sort of use that as inspiration for the record, right? 16 tracks. Yeah, yeah. Here's this poem about a guy who finds his way finds his way into um, new circumstances, new strange and dark circumstances, and then walks his way through it until he until he comes out the other side. You know, um, so I, t- I was kind of it felt like in the last few years. I, I know I certainly. It, it felt wrong not to come out of the last three years of a pandemic and not acknowledge in some way. And there's part of me that's absolutely allergic to writing songs that focus too much on the lockdown experience yeah. or the pandemic experience. Um, None of those pandemic records did well, by the way. You have to just say, like, <laughs> this is just a record, right? It's, so, yeah, yeah, it's kind of, you know, yeah, I think I think we all lived it. We all made sense of it in our yeah. own way and we all came out the other side our own way. And I think that's what I just wanted to nod to in, in having a structure of an album that has a descent at the beginning that follows follows this path that nods to this path of through circles that that Dante outlines in in this in this poem in it's which is um, you know which is it, it, it's also a poem that I was kind of reading in the pandemic when I had the time and I just resonated with some of the themes some of the language in it um 
but he comes out the other side. One, one, one thing that he writes at the top of the doorway, that, that famous quote of abandon all hope, ye who enter here is, is like well remembered as what he writes, but that's a larger passage. And one of the early lines in that is, is through me, you enter into the population of loss. And it just seemed like there was so much in those early few months of the pandemic, there was so much that was, that was potentially hung in over us with regards loss. People had um, loved ones they could lose, the jobs that were that disintegrated. There was a way of life disintegrated, a context for the way we had been socializing, our understanding of socializing, um, the simplest of social interactions, um, you know, you know, c t physical contact totally changed. Um, our, so, so much was potentially, I think, hanging over in the air with regards to this idea of loss. Um, lives that were being lost at the time, number of cases just being reported constantly. And there was something surreal about that. So it, it, do, it did feel strange to just come out of that period and not, not acknowledge um, some, something of a journey through that period of time. I think everyone's perspective on life changed after that, for sure. I mean, one of my favorite songs, by the way, on the record, Francesca has a, a bit of a dark story behind it. So talk to me about the meaning behind that song. Yeah. Um, Francesca, yeah, which is a direct, which is a, ooh, I'm kicking this table, um, <laughs> which is a kind of more of a direct reference to the text. There's a character in it called Francesca de Romini, and um, she's a historical figure from Florence that Dante writes that he recognizes uh, he comes across this hurricane and which, which is just full of souls. It's just constant, like it's a hurricane because I think in the translation I read that this group of people, this enormous group of people oppressed by black air, they're being tossed around in this very, very dark space forever for having been swept off their feet in real life. But Francesca is, um, uh, he is, is among them as this real historical figure, but it's kind of, she died under circumstances that like she was murdered for for falling in love with 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 somebody and um that song kind of tries to do two things it's me sort of you know it's it's my own personal reflections and and something that i something that i wrote uh regarding somebody who was very close to me at the time and and, and things that they were going through but then also it is it's an it's a kind of seeks to ameliorate or sort of undermine this idea that that somebody would be punished for that mm. um to sort of write from an empathetic point of view and say, well, no, actually, this is a ch choice I made to, to love this person and I won't be punished for it. This is actually being with this person for eternity is the best thing that could ever happen. Um, so trying to sort of turn that punishment on its head a little bit. Yeah, and talking about, again, the reference of the poem, because not every song on the record is referencing that. A lot of it just comes from personal experiences and then you use that as sort of a template for the record. Yeah. So in, in the poem, you know, it's, he arranges hell into circles. So the songs, if, if sometimes they, they, they might nod to the imagery or some elements that are, that are specific to the poem, but, but either way, the, the, they definitely will resonate with, with one of those circles. So if it's the circle of wrath or the circle of greed or gluttony, the song will be like eat your young represents the, the circle of gluttony. So there is that. And there's, there's, there's no, not that I know of, actually there is, I think it, there's a character further on in circle nine where there's a father who ate his ch ate his child and I think but I think he's in the um, but <laughs> we each won't young, talk about that we won't talk about that <laughs> but each young yeah it just nods to this 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 idea of gluttony and then this idea of greed this idea of wrath whatever this idea of heresy and uh, all of these feelings and um, all of these themes um so that in, in that way, it, it, it sometimes resonates like that. Francesca is a direct reference. There's more, there's some indirect references here and there, but um, yeah. So I guess that's how it, how it, how it took shape, how it took form. And you got to work with the amazing Brandy Carlisle. We were just mm -hmm. talking about that, but damage gets done. Like when did you connect with her? What was that mm -hmm. like working with her? I've known she's a force. By the she way. is a force. She's yeah. an absolute force. Um, <clears throat> incredible artist. Um, Somebody who, I mean, somebody whose work I admire. There's such courage in her work. There's such, and in her, in the in the spaces she cultivates, she cultivates such a space of 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 of, of warmth and celebration and inclusion. Um, in in everything that she she does, and in, in and in honoring in honoring artists that are that need, that should, and it's important to honor. I think you know with regards Joni, and and she um to Joni Mitchell, and, and she invited me into one of the very early Joni jams back in L.A. Um, 
she was like, hey, would you want to have dinner at, at Joni Mitchell's house? And I was like, yeah, let me just book a flight. <laughs> yeah. I think we're in Texas. I think I'm somewhere. around for that. I yeah. think I can fly yeah. a thousand miles. For that. Um, you know, and what's Joni Mitchell like now when you meet her? I haven't met. I haven't met Joni for since since that evening. Um, but she was she was she was wonderful. She was. I mean, she was she was very talkative. She was. Um, she shared she shared a great deal of of like we. Yeah, she shared a great deal. She, we played. That was a really surreal night. It was like, Brandy was like, "Hey, we're just gonna have dinner and and you know at Joni Mitchell's house at Joni Mitchell's house and and <laughs> you know I get the impression she's kind of said that she just misses having music around and having people playing music. So it would be cool to bring that into the space and it'd be cool. So that's what I say about Brandy creating spaces that are that that people thrive in, people feel good in, people people feel welcome in and included in. And she she works from this place of love and 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 in this very open armed sort of sort of place. And um so it was like this very simple thing of like, let's just let's just play music and see what happens. And like, you know, just brought a guitar and then and then I think I arrived in that day, we were on the way to the house. She was like, "Oh yeah, by the way, I think Herbie Hancock is coming. I think Shaka Khan is coming. They're all you know, so <laughs> so play like, concert somewhere. Yeah, yeah, it was nuts. Did you have a mentor ever? Because I feel like Joni was Brandy's mentor in a sense. Do you have a, Do you have a mentor that you look up to or that you work with early on? Um, no one that I worked with early on. I think there, if there was mentors, there's a, definitely a few people who were I was blessed with. You know, family and and friends who offered me good advice early on, or or let me gave me the tools. Um, you know, I, one of my first, my first electric guitar was given to me by, by an uncle, my first DAW, my first interface, audio interface was given to me by uh, another uncle who was like, just do it, you know, just do it yourself. You know, um, you don't need somebody else, wait on somebody else's skills because ultimately you'll be unhappy with it. Like, you know, figure out how to make the thing that you feel rep represents you and make it. And I think... You know, I'd, I'd, I had an uncle who invested in me in that, in that way. He sort of gave me my first little like Yamaha interface and I put I ended up recording some of my first demos on that. Um, was he a musician? No, no, no. He had he had some history of doing 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 some stuff maybe with A&R when he was younger. Um, and he was really, really interested in music. That's, that's one of my uncles. My other uncle is a musician. Yeah. And and I still play some of his guitars on stage. Amazing. I still tour with. This like this Dan Electro, this Stratocaster, all of this this stuff that that he he very generously um, gave to me, you know, years and years ago when I was still a teenager, that are still part of my sort of musical arsenal. Um, so yeah, so so I had the I had people around me who who you know who supported me and, and, and gave me license, gave me license to do what I what I what I could do, you know, or want to open up my potential a little bit, you know. You've already toured a bit for this new record, by the way. You just got back. Are you playing the songs live? What seems to be connecting with people live on this new record? What seems to be connecting? Um, it's it's crazy. I feel like, like unknown is definitely connected. Unknown with people. is something that yeah. connected. Yeah, yeah, I was gonna say it was that, again talking about just sharing something that was like getting a demo down and sharing it. I think I shared it on TikTok. That is one of the one of the amazing things about the kind of. A system like that is you can just like, hey, here is something I have done. Here is a song that I think is cool or a snippet or an idea that I think is cool. And it's nascent and it's maybe embryonic. It's still early. And people can tell you immediately, you don't have to go into studio. You don't have to come up with a, with a plan for it. It's just like, hey, here's a thing that I think is cool. And it's direct. You have direct access to people who are like, this is this is sweet. We love it. Um, and that that put that put wind in my sails for that song. And and um. So by the time that I was playing it live, it's like people know this song already. They've 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 sat with it for months, you know, um, long before it was ever even recorded in a studio. Um, I love your connection with the fans. By the way, you even went to Brighton not long ago, and you were like busking in the street there. I'm sure when people showed up there and they heard you singing, they must have been like, "There's no way that toes you're singing. Take me to church in the street in Brighton." Yeah, it was that was fun. We had a, we had a good turn. It was absolutely to rent. It was. The torrential rain at the, at the moment and it was bright and pride you know um so i think we'd let people know a couple of hours earlier earlier that day we we're like hey meet us at the pavilion we had a little bit of a, a place to sing underneath but um it was a good turnout you know i think doing stuff like that it, it's it is it, in a way it's a little bit of a reset you know you 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 you're just yourself again 
playing music in a way that is you've done since you were a kid. There's no conceit. There's no I, there's no conceit of a show. You know, it's just like here's a person with a guitar. They're just they're just singing a song, and this isn't a show. This isn't a, this isn't a performance. It's not even. There's no there's no there's no barrier. Uh, energetically or physically between yourself and the audience and that if that makes sense you're mm. just standing in space and people are, are right around you and you're just singing a song there's something really nice about that it's an interaction you know rather than a transaction you know do you prefer those intimate shows because you're, you're actually playing like madison square garden here you're playing some incredible shows the hollywood bowl all sold out by the way so congrats Thank on that you. do you prefer those those intimate shows or do you prefer the bigger shows i think I, 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 I love them. I missed them for a long time. So when we came around, we did the Bowery again recently. Um, we did uh, we did the Bowery Ballroom. We did like the Troubadour. We just did a tour for the last few months. We've just been touring club shows. And I was really getting a great sense of that, this kind of conversational, something that feels like it's like a, a little secret party that we're all having. You know, it's 400 people. That, the energy is so focused. Um, Way different than like Glastonbury where there's like 100,000 people out there and you can't even see anyone. It's totally. just a sea of faces. Right? Yeah. yeah. Then you're then you're singing to a concept, right? <laughs> the conceptual crowd. Yeah. Um, rather than, yeah, it's rather than a, a group of people, you know. Um, I suppose it's, there's different ways you can sort of, sort, sort of make sense of it, but there is... Your, the the crowd itself becomes something else, you know. But um, yeah. So, but I'm ready. I think having done so many club shows this year, I'm ready to sort of to to do the other thing. I'm ready to to come and do some bigger shows again. You know? Awesome. And there's uh, I'd be hard pressed not to mention you know the fact that Sinead O'Connor died recently, and I think that you found out maybe when you were on stage, you did a great tribute to her. What did she mean to you and her impact being Irish and yeah. on the music community? Actually, I saw something that was. Fairly interesting saying, you know, it's okay to celebrate people when they're alive. You know, it seems like so many people came out of the woodwork to celebrate her after she died, but I don't feel like she was as celebrated the last few years. And it's sad because yeah. honestly, an incredible artist. Yeah. Um, 100%. I think all too often we, we, we take for granted the existence of somebody and then it's, and then we're having to measure how much has been lost or having to measure how much of an empty space now we have on our hands that we have in our sort of collective our collective field, you know, where did this, and so within the case of Sinead, it just felt like that day, like there was in our collective field, certainly in Ireland, here was this incredible force, this creative force, this force that had such clarity in their moral vision, in their moral courage, very unapologetic in their vision, and an absolute searing like needle sharp artist um, and a brilliant artist. And th this was this kind of force that sat with us. And I think we took for granted that we might be the benefit, benefit, beneficiaries of mm. for um, decades to come and to, to, to lose her at, 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 at that young age. To bring it back to Brandy Carlisle, somebody again who, you know, something I admire about Brandy is she's, she makes efforts to celebrate artists while we have them. And, um, it is so important, but in, in the case of Sinead, um, yeah, and I like I have to reckon with the fact that I'm kind of walking roads that in many ways she she paved. she paved and yeah. she paved at great cost. Definitely. So um, the sensibilities she rattled people's sensibilities quite a bit with um, confronting the questions that she confronted. Mm -hmm. You look back and she was never wrong. You know, she was never wrong about her observations, with, especially with regards uh, church abuses. Um, but the, the sort of collective inability or cowardice or discomfort with, with approaching those questions, looking at them with courage, looking at them with honesty, looking at them with, with the stomach that was needed to look at them. When people don't have that collectively, they oftentimes, you know, the person who brings up the question could pay the price. She mm. paid, she paid in great scrutiny and, and great criticism for for her observations. And I think, yeah, those roads so that that she kind of paved, I I'm kind of walking and, and thriving on now. And so I, I do owe her a great deal as as, uh, as an artist. You know, I really do. Yeah, I feel like there's so many artists from Ireland that have depth. Every artist from there has a great sense of depth and meaning. And unlike a lot of other artists today, where there's there's a story and there's a lot of integrity there. So she, you're right. She paved the way and. 
um, yeah, it, it, she'll be missed for sure. So we do this really fun thing at the end of the show where we talk about your top five lists and some things I want to get into for you. So I want to talk to you about the top five Irish acts ever for you. Christ. I can't believe that. Starting with number five. Oh, no, I can't. Well, I can't. I don't know. I, I, this is like <laughs> straight up, right on the, um, right. Okay, right. You put me on, you put me on the, my toes. Okay, in no order. Like, I can't do it in order because that would be crazy. But I have to include, um, Phil Linett comes into this. So I'm, I'm including Thin Lizzy uh, because. One of my favorite bands of all time. No way. Yes. Yeah. Underrated. I got it just because Phil is, is a Dublin, Dubliner. Um, yeah. Um, and I, yeah, and he was a bit, it was a big one. One of the first albums I was ever given, I was given an album by my, by my dad, uh, their Live and Dangerous album. Yeah, which, great record. F- great record. Yeah. Um, so for me, Thin Lizzy and Phil Linus, his him is a, has a charismatic rock and roll force as a writer. Uh, yeah, incredible. Um, I have to say as, a, you know, for the, the, the sort of the guitar kid in me, you know, being into like Jimi Hendrix and, and R- Rory Gallagher has to be in that top five, I think. So another he, underrated artist, by the way. Yeah, I think yeah. So, I think so. A lot of people in, don't know him here. Yeah, he's incredible, incredible blues guitarist and, and, and rock and roll guitarist. Um, and he just, it's like not even that he was this amazing electric guitarist. He'd pull out a mandolin and then just fucking shred on that thing. He'd pull out an acoustic guitar and then pull out a slide. He would shred on that thing. He was like, he's like... He's like Ireland's uh, Dwayne Allman, you know yeah. what I mean? Um, uh, so I think, yeah, I think Rory Gallagher, yeah, he's he 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 would have to be on this list. Number three, Num- for me, um, just based on influence, uh, the influence that his work has had on me, um, Astral Weeks, etc., uh, the Moon Dance album. Van Morrison was for me a very very influential artist, and I have to credit that. Um, I have to be honest. Until I researched this, I didn't even know he was Irish. I yeah. had no idea. He's from Northern Ireland. <laughs> I yeah. Didn't know. yeah. Yeah. He's from Northern Ireland. Um, <laughs> I didn't know. Yeah. It's um, true. Yeah, he's from Northern Ireland. Yeah. And it, you can kind of hear it a little bit in, in in his in his in his in his singing sometimes. He has that that um that voice. I think um this is this is so tough it's, uh, to do it five because there's like I don't even know if I can like if I'm gonna be able to fit in the pogues into this and Shane McGowan. I'm not sure if I'm gonna be able to fit in like, uh, um, I mean, you two has to come into this. Well, we're, we're at number two. So your number, two. Your number okay. two would be? It would be, okay. Um, okay. I don't know how many. Okay. This is tough. This is tough. Might it be the Pogues? It might maybe, it be you too? Maybe it be the Pogues. I'm gonna the s- Cranberries. I'm just going to start throwing out I think, references here. I think, I think I have to go with the, I think. Because then now I've three, you've given me what have I two left <laughs> yeah, and I haven't it. even I haven't put it's in Sinead. top five not top ten we've tried to do top ten top five seems to okay I think yeah. Sinead has to come in I okay. think Sinead has to come in here um this is really tough this is is this for me my list or just what I think that this are the is top what five? you think um this is not okay <laughs> so we're gonna do the top seven <laughs> um, I have to give a special mention to the cranberries and how influential Dolores O'Riordan her voice um. As an instrument, when I hear that for the first time and going, oh, you can sing like that? Like she opens up her accent, she opens up the natural sort of glottal um, leaps in her voice. Um, so the Cranberries are an incredibly special band to me. Sinead O'Connor, incredibly uh, like a remarkable artist. U2, their achievement is just astounding. Their, like U2's achievement is absolutely astounding. And what Bono in particular has has done in, in, uh, in sort of like trying to cancel global debt is 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 amazing and i think i think um uh the the it's it's going to be hard to quantify the the result of 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 all of the incredible work that he's done in funding like malaria um treatment etc and trying to try to abolish malaria you know that's 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 in, incredible um and try to cancel global debt that's incredible um would they be your number 2 um <laughs> I don't know. I can't. I, I can't give you a solid five. I think. I think they. They would ne- maybe be. 
they they'd nearly have to be number one, I think, just for for what they've achieved globally. But um, and number two being the cranberries. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> they can't put me in this position. So the Sinead, there's the Pogues. Paul Brady is another hugely influenced influential artist for me. If, if people are inter- interested in traditional music, get into to, into the Bahi band or Planksty, and um, get into Moving Hearts. But Paul Brady, I think, for his playing in open tunings and listening to him playing like uh, Mary and the Soldier and Arthur McBride and um, he opened in me an interest in, in writing more in open tuning so he's another artist that I think Christ there's too many there's, there's, too there's many. a lot well uh, this one's going to be extra hard too because a lot of people say you have one of the best voices in you know iconic voices out there in music today so my next list for you is the top five greatest voices in music today starting with number five we, we would put you on the list but this is uh, oh, people other than you thank you top five greatest voices I think for vocal um, ability I'm always astounded by Yeba uh, her her actual her voice the, the that is an instrument I'm always astounded by Brandy um, I she's mean, number two, four she um, yes there's Brandy okay. I mean Brandy Carla an incredible voice yep. but but there's the, the the sort of I think R&B is always this place where as an instrument it's like it's kind of like saying, okay, who's the best saxophonist ever? And, and you don't you don't look at jazz. You yeah. know what I mean? I think yeah. if you're looking at voices and you're not looking at, at R&B and soul music, it's it's hard. You know, it seems silly. Um, so Number three for you? I don't know. Um, voices, voices. Do they have to be living? No. Oh, okay. Well, that yeah. changes everything. <laughs> Just I thought they greatest voices, voices today. In music, yeah. Aretha Franklin, I think one of the greatest living vocal of greatest ever vocalists to have lived. Um, I, I still hear phrases, the way that she attacks phrases, the way she lets go of phrases, the way she times, she, she, you know, she sits, she, she's behind the beat. The, the feel of her uh, approach astounds me still. Uh, so Aretha Franklin and um, Etta James. Number two. Oh Edith no, James. actually, um, Ella Fitzgerald. I'm sorry. But number two. Ella Fitzgerald, yeah. Okay. Ella Fitzgerald is maybe number one. Um, Billy Holiday was a huge voice for me. Otis Redding was a huge voice for me. Um, I think we skipped over two, but we can insert we did, one of those we, in number two. Did. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. I can't give a solid five. And and, <laughs> um, and then a voice I listened to again. I went back to an old favorite, it Wild as the Wind by Nina Simone. And for what is carried in a voice, because it's like hard to describe why a voice is because you don't need to have a pretty voice or a technical, technically sound voice for a voice to be remarkable. I think, I think um, I kind of reject this notion that I've, I've, I think for me sometimes the more perfect voice is, you know, I, you know, in in that sort of there's 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 different there's different ways of approaching it. But what you carry in a voice, when I hear Nina Simone sing like "Wild as the Wind," that to me is like that's there's, it. For you. That's it. That's yeah. it. That is. Yeah, that does it for me. Amazing. Well, great list, by the way. Thank you. Definitely. So the tour is coming up September 9th, St. Louis. You excited for it? Um, I am so excited for it. We're playing playing some really iconic venues I haven't yeah. played before. Yeah, so I am. Where are you excited to play besides MSG, the Hollywood Bowl? Hollywood Bowl. Um, I'm excited to go back to Red Rocks and sort One of... One of the greatest venues ever, by the way. Yeah, I got to play there. It was incredible. No way. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's, it's beautiful. Yeah. Did you get the altitude? Sick. I had to... Yeah, yeah. They, they give you like an oxygen tank and they put it next to you, which is weird because... Yeah, yeah but uh, it was incredible. And, and you'll have an amazing show there, I'm yeah. sure. Yeah. Super excited. Check out the new record, Unreal Unearth. Just came out today. Yes, thank you or very tomorrow, much. actually. Yes. Uh, well, but yeah, you. I look forward to everything. I look forward to seeing you here in New York or LA. Thank you. Thank yes. you just so much for coming in. You're a pleasure. It was a, it was a, it was a joy. I thank could do you. this for hours, but thank I know we don't have hours. Me. So thank and you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Hope to awesome. see you soon. You yeah. too.